you. So this is this is a, a method which is a really interesting one on two stage bidding and um, uh, in, interesting in in many ways. Let me let me kick off and, and quickly run through what it is that I'd like to go through. The first is there is confusion as to what this is, and we'll talk through a bit about that. But I'll share with you some definitions uh, and descriptions of what two stage bidding is from both MFMA, PFMA, World Bank, the banks. Uh, Yun Sutral, some of the leaders um, globally, and um, we'll give you some other names that are used. And then we'll start talking about circumstances for use examples and some considerations for implementing two-stage bidding. Now, I'm going to run through this quickly, and, uh, and then we can certainly engage thereafter. So let me quickly jump straight into it. This is a term which is not commonly understood amongst the procurement community that we've got in the country. Uh, some think that two-stage bidding is, well, we have functionality first, and then we do price and, and, and preference. Um, and that's possibly because the guide uh, says that in some cases. Isn't two-stage bidding, we have an envelope for technical, we have an envelope for uh, for pricing. Isn't that what two-stage bid? But isn't on panels two stages? Yeah, we have one stage where they get on the panel, we have a second stage where we request quotations. Isn't that two stage? Sometimes uh, one of the questions I had in a, in a workshop recently was, isn't two stage, well, we do an RFI and then, and then we issue the, the tender document and then we, we continue with the process. And, uh, and then when I say that negotiations is very often part of two stage, people say, but we do negotiate. So what's different? Um, why Why is this different? What is different about two-stage bidding to what we're doing? Let's have a look. Because when you when you look at the, the descriptions in, in both the PFMA and MFMA, and I've given you both here, they're similar but slightly different, um, you'll see this is a lot deeper than what um, some of the misconceptions are that I've just gone through. A two-stage bidding procedure may be used under which first unpriced technical proposals on the basis of a conceptual design or performance specification are invited, subject to technical as well as commercial clarifications and adjustments, wow, to be followed by amended bidding documents in the submission of final technical proposals and priced bids in the second stage. Wow, that's certainly a lot richer than than a two envelope process. So this is, this is two stage bidding is there's first a, a process and, and look at the words folk that are used here. In response to conceptual design or performance specification, right? So an un, unpriced technical proposal on the basis of conceptual design or performance specification subject to technical as well as commercial clarifications and adjustments, technical as well as commercial clarifications and adjustments. And then we would then issue the bidders with an updated technical requirement, which they then submit final technical proposals and prices in the second stage. So that's what we've got in, in the, um, the guides to the PFMA and MFMA and, and very similar is, um, is a World Bank document. And I, I've gone back to 2003. This the Two-stage bidding has been around for a long time. Um, it's often the purchaser's business functional requirements. Now, please don't, don't understand functional requirements as being what we understand to be functionality in 2017, the 2011 and 2017. It's very different, folks. Functionality in the rest of the world is very different to how we understand functionality in South Africa. Public sectors. Right? Um, functional requirements, which form the base of the bidding document, rather than, de rather than detailed technical specifications. In the first bidding stage, the purchaser solicits non-price technical proposals to address these functional requirements. By the way of a direct and structured dialogue, the purchaser arrives with each competent bidder at a clear and documented understanding of those aspects of the bid. But as bid that will fulfill the purchase requirements do not conform to the requirements and or missing um, requirements. Based on this bidder specific documented understanding, 
Each bidder that offered a sufficiently responsive first stage bid is requested by the patient to submit a second stage technical proposal and corresponding financial proposal, i.e. a complete final and processed bid. So even the word dialogue has crept into this particular discussion in, um, in the World Bank. The Asian Development Bank, um, sorry, that's, that should be ADB, Asian Development Bank, two-stage bidding procedure may be used under which unpriced technical proposal invited first, they're prepared on the basis of conceptual design performance specification. You'll see this coming through again and again and again. First stage technical proposals, clarification to be followed by issuance of amended bidding documents and the submission of a final technical proposal and price bid. The African Development Bank, an unpriced technical proposal, you can see it's coming through again and again and again. Um, the, the solicitation document may be amended for the second stage of bidding in which all responsive and qualified bidders are then invited to submit final technical and price bids. The UN Central um, acknowledged that even in their earlier um, 94 version of the um, uh, model, um, uh, the, the, I get another word, the, the model policy that uh, UN Central already in, in the 1990s, um, this is used, a method of procurement, and one forms a bit which the main distinct feature is two stage process, first stage, discussions with the procuring entity and suppliers or contractors, all right, in order to refine aspects of the description of the subject matter. And then the second stage involves submission of final tenders. And please, very interesting to note, this two-stage bidding is distinct. It's different from request for proposal without negotiation, request for proposal with dialogue, request for proposal for second negotiations, competitive negotiations in the UN Central um, model law, model law. Arithmeth, um, Professor Sue Arithmeth in the UK um, has written many books together with um, uh, Professor Gia Kino um, and others. Two-stage tendering is a two-stage method of formal tendering commonly used in procurement system in particular, which is not possible to set a detail, where it's not possible to set a detailed specification for a contract at the outset of the procedure. The technical financial proposal is submitted separately, but one before the other rather than simultaneously. The key feature of this procurement method is the submission of proposals takes place in two stages. Lynch does a lot of training globally. And then the SANS um, uh, construction standard talks about two-state centering appropriate only when the employer is not really sure of what it requires or has extreme difficulty expressing its requirements. The procedure allows the scope of work to be developed together with tenderers. Every one of these definitions I've just shared with you comes either from PFMA, MFMA, or other recognized public uh, procurement institutions. I've put a, a um, suggested definition together to try and, and come up with something. I'm looking forward to engaging um, on this one, contract discussions with qualified bidders on initial unpriced proposals before final offers in a second round. That's a working definition. We'll certainly work on that as we go. There are many different names that are used for this. Um, UNCITROL talks about two-stage tendering. Uh, the Asian Development Bank talks about a two-stage two bidding procedure, two-stage contracting, two-stage procurement, very, very similar terms that are used in a similar context. There are many other methods. The competitive procedure with negotiations is similar. Multi-stage negotiations, request for proposal are, are similar, related. They are different, but they're related methods in, in that there's typically uh, different stages and there are updates to tender documents through the process. And there's a wide range of other methods that can be brought into this uh, hybrid, uh, including frameworks, expression of interest you can bring in, request for qualification, et cetera are different methods that you can build into the circumstances for use. So when is it typically good to use these things? Now, the PFMA and MFMA, MFMA manuals talk about turnkey contracts. Very interesting, and there's a definition. You certainly go and have a look at turnkey contracts in, in the guides. Contracts for large, complex plants, works of a specialist nature, and where it's undesirable or impractical, interesting, undesirable or impractical to prepare complete detailed technical specifications in advance. Notice that through this process, 
Uh, there's there's a distinction between technical specifications, performance specifications, functional specifications. Specifications are not specifications. There are different types of specifications that are out there. Buin Sotrol says technically sophisticated and complex items. Evidence that obtaining the best value for money is unlikely if you attempt to draw up a complete description of the procurement setting up all the technical requirements, quality, performance characteristics, it's unlikely that you're gonna get the value for money if you attempt to do that from the outset. Um, very interesting, Yuen Sutra, where the employer is not really sure as to what it requires or extreme difficulty expressing requirements. African Development Bank, it's not feasible or possible to fully describe and define the technical or contractual aspects of the procurement process at the outset. The circumstances around the procurement process and its implementation are uncertain and employer purchaser wish to leave open the choice of a final detailed technical solution. So there's some ideas around the different circumstances for use. And, and if, we, if we look then at the, the different sources where they give examples of the kinds of uh, categories, commodities that are used, high technology items, large passion to aircraft, communication system, technical equipment, infrastructure procurement, including large complex facilities, construction of, of a specialist nature, turnkey design and build contracts is what Aerosmith says, um, uh, supply and installation such as power, water, telecommunications, hydropower, dams, waste, water treatment, pumping stations, power generator, sewage works, et cetera. Some of the examples Aerosmith suggests that it would be used for. African Development Bank, um, Turkey co contracts come through again, supply and installation of facility, plant under single responsibility contracts, works of com complex specialist nature, in particular where innovations are sought or complex ICT systems that are subject to rapid technology advances for which it is unusual, usually is undesirable and practical to prepare complete technical specifications in advance. And I've seen some, some of the real difficulties that um, some of you go through when you're trying to procure ERP systems, for example, or systems that are continually changing. Uh, some great examples there. And the World Bank is a very, very specific. They've in fact got uh, standard bid documents for two-stage bidding just for uh, the installation of information, supply and installation of information systems. And they describe their complex business applications, extensive software development, complex information technology, large-scale data processing, now this is you know this is a document which was put together twenty years ago, so we can certainly add in other aspects of of um, and and some of the things I'm I'm seeing as well on the ground, things like uh, the Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, for, um, fourth industrial revolution related technologies, um, extensive technical service, a combination of the above. So there's some examples of some of them now. Here are some ex um, some real examples that I've been able to to uh, to to get wastewater treatment plant in China. This is one where the Asian Development Bank went out on this two stage bidding process. Uh, seven firms, four local, three foreign submitted technical proposal on the first stage um, with approval. They invited the second stage bids from six firms, and of those six, four submitted bids in the second stage. Transnet, very interesting, had um, also one which I think falls into this. They didn't call it specifically two-stage, but uh, they're looking for a, um, this is Transnet Freight Rail, um, to try and, and, and get a better handle on the, the, the technology involved here. Master Trench Chief brings back uh, memories and nightmares for me in, in this a myriad of, of problems that they've stated. They're looking for different su su suggestions and solutions. Um, uh, here it is, and you can see here that they're, they're looking for concepts, they're looking for solutions, they're looking for some ideas. They're putting out there the problems and looking for solutions. And very interesting, uh, we're almost towards the end of these examples. Um, hey, this can also be a question applicable for revenue generating contracts. And here one is Petra SA, and here they, they call for uh, conceptual proposals on an incentivized basis to partner with, with um, Petra SA. And the main objective of these partners is to assist Petra in commercial monetizing remaining gas potential. 
interested parties make proposals for all a combination of, of, of all. So there's, there's different uh, lots, if you like. Proposals received will be evaluated by Petraeser and followed by discussions with interested parties. They may involve a transaction advisor in this process. In conclusion, here are some thoughts on, on the, if you like, success factors in getting this done if you are going to be using this. One is, um, I suggest that you have a very, very clear understanding of the requirements for using a method that is not legislated by name. So in many discussions that, that I have with you and, and with others, when you start talking about a method which is not legislated, not legislated people are worried. And, um, and we, we did a, a talk two weeks ago where I went through and explained what I believe are the main requirements for using a method which is not currently legislated explicitly in our legislation. And I think um, certainly be aware of that and understand if you if you do go out, what what do you need to put in your um, in your conditions of tender? Be very clear also on um, and how you qualify bidders. It is not practical that you go out and you decide that you're going to engage with everybody who submits a proposal. It's not practical to do that. So you need to have a very clear um, way in which you're going to qualify bidders on a fair basis before you get into the, the discussions or negotiations with them. Very, very clear understanding of the difference between a technical specification and a specification which is performance-based or functional-based or outcomes-based. I see your hand, Ingrid, almost finished. And then a very, very clear understanding of, of the engagement of how you will negotiate with bidders or discuss with bidders and, and, and the rules that you'll use. And, and I um, suggest if you want, uh, you know, have a look at what um, uh, you and Citroen have got. One of the things that they, they state very clearly in two-stage bidding is you do not discuss financials in the first stage. Uh, interesting because that's slightly different to, to um, the definition that we saw up front from the PFMA and MFMA, where they said you can engage in technical and commercial aspects, and then, then have a very clear understanding on how you will work with two-stage bidding in, in both the specifications committee and evaluation committee, because it, there's an overlap, and you want to be very clear in your mind as to how that works. There are some thoughts from my side on, on that, very, very pleased to take any, any thoughts or comments from yourself now. Ingrid, welcome. Hi, Sean. Good morning. You know, this is such a, morning everyone, this is such a massive subject, bearing in mind that Treasury will be engaging in every industry in South Africa. So, you know, to try and even get a two-stage process that makes sense, for every industry, I mean, you know, the output is what you're looking at. And I would say that when they say that um, money mustn't be discussed up front, surely every department has a budget. So that must come into the conversation. That is my one point. And then sure. it depends whether you're looking at services, whether are you procuring services, goods, infrastructure. For example, in construction, there's no way you can start talking about technical specifications until you've appointed the you've procured the consulting engineer to go out there and do the actual design so you know that would almost be a two-stage process do yeah. the design then do a bill of quantities and then talk about specifications and then talk about capacity to to have a one fit all in all industries in south africa i, I suggest is a very very difficult task because it depends where different input comes in in terms of design, specification, budget. You know, um, obviously a turnkey project where you say we've got 10 million rand, you want an airport, you get the engineers, you do this, you do that, put out specifications. But obviously Treasury is looking at government departments who are implementing with a budget different stages of a process. Sure. And that's the complication. 
Sure, good, good. Thanks, Kat, um, Ingrid. Just a, a quick one. Um, these are Sean's, right? These, what's on this, this slide right now, this is not Treasury, this is Sean. Um, no, sure. And, yeah, but I'm um, saying it will all fall on Treasury eventually, who has the budget. Now, that's that's why we're starting these discussions. I'm yep. very pleased to see that National Treasury are, are here and, and listening because um, they, they're very aware that they have to develop uh, the regulations for all the methods that will be used. So um, And all different industries, you know, I mean, whether you're buying paper, whether you're building a bridge, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a complex Construction of, of, of an airport versus construction of a complex IT system is very different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are commonalities, there's some similarities in places, but uh, it still is different. But the steps Thanks. of the procedure, where you have budget, where you have specifications, all of that, you know, is not easily defined as a two-stage process that fits all industry and all procurement, unfortunately. Sure, sure. Remember, this is one of many different methods. One of many. Great. Thank you, Ingrid. And any other comments? I rushed through this. I uh, just wanted to at least get this uh, get this on record. Um, very, very glad. Um, um, welcome any engagement on what we've just run through. Hello, Ron. Hello, Sean. Just to thank you for an outstanding presentation, Sean. And uh, I'm not going to engage with this. Uh, it will be considerable. We can deal with that offline. But, Sean, what it does do um, is it begs the question about what is a method. Um, so, uh, and I'm not going to go into the debate of procedure versus system versus tender versus system, you know, all the other terms used in these definitions, but to rather go back to the mm. something that is very practical, which is the mm. uh, public procurement bill, mm. they have in it a requirement for a database. Now, they've never identified that database as essentially being, at minimum, the CSD. Now, if I read the methods literature, the fact that you are insisting that you can only use a supplier that's on your approved database is actually a method. And uh, so that's the first stage. The first stage is that the supplier has to meet minimum qualifying criteria. In the case of CSD, they have to be tax compliant. Um, if, in order for you to engage mm -hmm. with them, mm -hmm. okay? And they've also got to meet certain, you know, they've got to give certain minimum information. But uh, so it just begs the question whether in fact we should be categorizing in the public procurement bill the, the creditors or the prospective suppliers database as a method. Mm. And I suspect it is a method. Mm. Um, and it is a stage, uh, but mm. that's pure conjecture mm. at the stage. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, thanks, Ron. Hello, Martin. Martin, just as you're unmuting, uh, congratulations yeah. on your LLB and... Um, oh, uh, LLM. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, LLM, well yeah. done. <clears throat> yeah, and um, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, yes, a lot of it concentrated, particularly my thesis, concentrated on... Um, some of the provisions in the in the new UK Act, um, particularly around management of supplier past performance. Um, at the moment, that's not it's not publishable, but it may it may may see a published form at, at some point. But um, but no, I just wanted Thanks. to say, look, th thank you for this session, both in terms of the update of the uh, the South African Bill, um, which. Sounds positive. I'm not quite sure whether it was one step forward and two steps back, or two steps forward and one step back. I hope I hope the latter. Um, but I think you'll mention that um, there is a suggestion that there will be feeders to a national tribunal. Quite frankly, if there aren't, you know my view. Yeah, that would yeah, just become yeah. a. It would just become a a, a block shot. Yeah. Um, and I think also taking into consideration um, the, uh, the, rig the the costing structure 
um, will be useful because there will there will be a benefit. The benefit there's got to be a benefit mm. to putting mm. that extra investment in mm. in terms of uh, proportion of your mm. your, your your, your trillions of rands mm. uh, of managed saving, at least in theory. Um, so that's good. And also, thank you so much for your reminder about um, the the actuality of, of, of what two stage bidding is in terms of Answer Trial World, World Bank and, and related stuff. I think that is going to be useful um, in the UK context as well, because we're looking to formalize the concept of pre market engagement. Um, and at the moment, folks here have not really got their head round mm. what that actually, uh, or, or they, how they would manage that without producing conflicts of interest in the main procurement. So I think um, I'd certainly I'm looking forward to a copy of the slides at any rate, which I will uh, <laughs> roundly repurpose or steal with your but, permission. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Martin, I can't let you go. Um, go on. Without, without asking, how's the flexible procedure going? Um, okay, is that starting to be fleshed out now at a regulation level and elsewhere? Well, at the moment, with the, the I, I was at a conference last week, which was a little bit of a, a, a an under resourced bun fight, or in other words, the number of attendees to the amount of um, space was there. But mm. there was indication that it doesn't appear that cabinet office are going to be laying down um templates for competitive flexible oh, um, is it interesting um, <clears throat> so so that does really keep keep the whole business and we talked about you know how do you use a, a something which is not a regulated um mm. uh, procedure um the interesting thing is is obviously uh, they did did acknowledge that, of course, we'll be able to continue to use the current procedures if we wish. Um, we'll be able to, in, in fact, actually, I, I do think there will be a, a real business case for more complex um, opportunities of of trying to, you know, revisit the two stage bid um, concept. Um, there, there is some a degree of supplier. Um, concern um that mm. this will highlight the um uh the inability of public procurers to actually explicitly explain how they are going to run a process and then follow it <laughs> but um uh but no it's it, I, I think that there's quite a lot of excitement in one camp and quite a lot of trepidation um particularly along the buyer community um uh, so but it It'll be an interesting point. The The only other thing which also came out, which was of interest, not to do with CFP, um, was that it appears that any procurement completed before the, bill, uh, before the Act um, comes into effect, which is nominally set for October this year, general elections not, notwithstanding. Interesting. Um, that any procurement that is let before that um, will then be managed through its life under the um, under the existing EU-based PCR 2015. Oof. Now, uh, the lawyers have um, obviously pointed out that, in fact, actually there were, uh, Emily Heard, for example, yeah. said that she thought that changes to contracts after the Act come into place will be subject to the new Act. Um, it appears that government guidance is not currently looking to do that. Yeah. So we're going to have the additional resource complexity of um, contract managers having to, first of all, tick the box on the tree. Is this an old contract or a new contract before they can do things like um, contract variation change? In, indeed, even. Um, uh, performance management will be subject to two separate regimes. Um, uh, the interesting thing also was that almost with that in mind, some uh, authorities are saying, actually, we're looking to delay um, running procurements 
until after the new act comes wherever possible mm-hmm. to to basically reduce reduce that that the, the, level of, of complexity. The complexity. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, if if buying authorities do decide to pause procurements for the second quarter of this year, um, or possibly even the second and third quarters of this year, um, suppliers are not going to be particularly happy. Hmm. Um, because Thanks, it will Martin. affect... So, okay, enough from me. Um, but, Thank um, you. Uh, uh, thanks again and, for and, an and, and, and Interesting update. So everybody who's... Um, wondering what competitive flexible procedure is it's what you've been doing in south africa for the last couple of years uh, uh but they've just given it a name now in the uk um yeah thanks thanks it's, Martin. It, <laughs> yeah it's make it up as you go along but make sure your suppliers know what you're doing good one thank you ron would you like to come in um oh uh, African, I think you raised your hand first. So, so Ron, if you would mind just holding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sean. Uh, Sean, thanks for the um, well-researched paper, because I believe it is a paper. However, my question is uh, two, two, two questions. Your last slide is dealing with two strategically interesting uh, terms. It talks to you can go to the, your, your very last slide. Yeah. Very last slide. It deals with two things that are interesting for me. The outcome. And there was a second one. And and, and the, the question for me is, uh, how do you reconcile? And of course, when you say outcome, for me, I'm looking at it from a strategic perspective. To say the outcome in terms of what is it that is the end state, not the outcome of a of a of a process. The end state of, if for example I speak energy, if you're talking about a resource plan, the outcome of an implementation of a resource plan, right? So that's 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 yes, especially because uh, yes, outcomes based. Can you see that? Yes, the outcome yes, based, yes, performance yes. based. Yes. Now those two for me, especially when you look at. Uh, the multilateral posture as gleaned from the unicentral, and then you look at our domestic posture. The, the the question then for me is that: Are we are, are we looking at an outcomes focus? Because a performance focus and an outcomes focus are two different focus. Focus, and and linking with what the colleague was talking about in terms of various sectors having different requirements. My question then becomes, um, where do we situate this debate within where we are now of, of, of the regulatory development process? Where, where, at what point do we input what we're dealing with here? Is it at regulatory level or at, I'm separating this to the regulations, the delegated legislation, and the acts, which is where we are. Where do we situate this? And I'm asking this because you ended up having two lines. Interestingly, two lines that are dealing with paragraphs and paragraphs from very various jurisdictions. So I would be interested in where then do you situate this particular discourse that we are in now? And again, in answering my question, how do you see us uh, recalibrating the conference as a contribution to further development? Mm. Good questions. Thanks, Sean. Uh, good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, um, Ron, do you want to come in? Um, Sean, I just want to build on Advocate Saluba's point about a paper. And... Uh, um, I think, you know, this presentation and a number of the ones you have given, Storm, have potential to be developed into academic papers. And that then begs the question of what is the next level from this platform? Mm-hmm. Seems at minimum we should be looking at possibly a specialist journal in procurement uh, in Africa. Um, Fanning, which we just make use of existing journals, like I think there's one called the African uh, Procurement Law Journal. Um, mm-hmm. Now, 
what was interesting listening to this presentation, Sean, is the governance. And you might have even have mentioned the 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 uh, bid committee system. Mm -hmm. But let's just 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 bear with me. So mm -hmm. normally you mm -hmm. have a bid mm -hmm. specification committee, then you have a bid evaluation committee, then you have the uh, the bid adjudication committee. And because National Treasury are going to now regulate uh, methods, the unintended consequence of uh, putting procedures in place in terms of those committees is you may not be able to apply some of the methods because the two may not speak to each other. So let me just take your example yeah. and, uh, and, and, and show just some of the implications for the regulators. And I'm glad National Treasury are, are, are present today so, so in terms of the the specification, so what I'm understanding with the one subtype is that you do a, a very broad specification, call it outcome based or call it um, request for proposals. It then goes through that stage. You then get the actual proposals. You agree on what particular specific, uh, you know, technical proposal works, and then you go out again. Now, foreseeably, you could have a different specification committee for the first one and the second one. Um, and secondly, is, um, is it's not sequential, it's iterative. You go back to the specification committee and the same logic holds for the evaluation. So um, you're doing an initial spec, it comes in, it goes through an initial evaluation. That evaluation may be limited to your technical experts and or your financial. But when you go out the second time for a second evaluation, there could be a different uh, composition because now you, you, you're looking at different, yeah. at different attributes. Now, let's throw a span into the works. Um, let's, let's say we include innovation as a circumstance. Some types of the procurement of innovation um, and some of the methods uh, which can be accommodated um, in this process to be credible. And for example, we've spoken about dialogue um, is a best practice when using uh, some forms of, um, of innovation competition like prizes is to have a jury, an independent jury. So, Let's say with the first stage that we have, um, you know, the proposals coming back to this um, so-called evaluation committee, depending on the nature of the circumstance, if it is innovative, it may provide better credibility if it's a jury, mm. an independent jury. Interesting. Um, and, and I'm just teasing out yeah. The, yeah. the need to integrate methods and procedures to the other parts of the bill, like governance, and and just to caution National Treasury to rather have a minimalist approach as opposed to a, a micro approach where you actually uh, strangle um, mm. uh, your your sort of innovation and uh, and your flexibility. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Maybe to build on Ron's point. Um, because the bill says very clearly that National Treasury must prescribe the, the methods, the procurement methods, methods for procurement, and, and um, circumstances and procedures. Now, this raise the, raises the level of complexity and detail that that statement in the bill gives to Treasury. Let's run through this. In a, in a two-stage bid, you go out with an initial, initial outcomes-based specification, performance specification. That then gets received. Typically, in a bid evaluation, bid committee system, the, those proposals are then evaluated by the bid evaluation committee. They would evaluate those bid evaluations at that stage just to qualify the bidders. Then there is a specifications 
process that then happens after that with, I guess, the specifications committee and the bidders to try and come up with an updated terms of reference or solicitation document, updated uh, technical requirements, which then gets given back to the bidders who then respond, and that then will then typically go back to the evaluation committee. But if you think about the level of detail that I've just gone into around all these issues, and then think about one of the little complications on, on um, negotiations. Very often we say you should only negotiate with bidders after the bid adjudication committee has agreed the basis on which you would negotiate. This is obviously negotiating price and, and other matters. Um, can you see the, the complexity that Treasury have got to deal with now? This is one method, one method. Um, Ron's raised the implications of the bid committee system. This is going to be a real, real tough challenge. Um, I, Ron, I don't know how we're going to make this easier for all concerned, but when we start to get down to the implications of the bill having to describe and regulate, it, it's, um, it's going to be a really, really tough challenge. And one of the big, big things that, that um, I think politically we're not discussing is a point that uh, Prof. Kino made a couple of um, weeks ago that we probably will see once the bill is implemented that there will be a drop in irregular expenditure. But within a couple of months after that, six months to maybe a year, the irregular expenditure is going to skyrocket because of the level of detail that we've got in legislation that will have to be complied with. Ron? Um. Sean, you used the term simplify. And uh, it triggered in my mind that there's a step before simplify. So bear with me. Einstein with the E equals MC squared. It's characterized by elegant simplicity. It's taken incredibly complex reality and putting it into a simple formula, which through its simplicity is elegant. But in order to get to the level of elegant, and I, I emphasize elegant, not just simplicity, in order mm. to get to that, you needed to understand the problem and the complexity. Yeah. Now, my, my uh, experience of National Treasury in particular, and, and let's not um, just um, call them out because I think it's a, a challenge that is faced by regulators internationally, is that there seems to be a tendency that in order to standardize and regulate, you need to simplify. But it's not just elegant simplicity, it's actually dumbing down. Uh, with the result that you end up having um, strangulation. Let me give you an example. Let's take um, the, the three, uh, three committee system again. So, you know, it's probably a good practice to have three committees. They, they, you know, they're good internal controls built in. It's a, it's a corruption busting measure. Um, and generally, it's probably a good idea, but it's not universally a good idea. And let me give you a, 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 the example again from innovation. Mm. So mm. I refer to this thing called a, um, a sort of um, jury, an evaluation jury. It's, in the innovation space, there are so few people who understand what you're trying to do in terms of specification and evaluation and even adjudication. It's not always practical having separate committees. Mm -hmm. So in the innovation space, you may end up having a combination of specification and or evaluation mm -hmm. and or adjudication mm -hmm. simply because um, you don't have the expertise plus the credibility. If you go, for example, with a competition prize mm. um, and you go to a, a, a sort of independent jury, mm. you know, they wouldn't just evaluate, they would probably also adjudicate. Mm. Um, uh, at minimum, make a recommendation, but, mm. you know, it's sort of, 
full, mm. full credibility, you, mm. you know. You know, if the BAC don't accept that recommendation, then it's a, it's a problem. So, and that's where, you know, and I referred to Ingrid's comments right in the beginning about categories. I shouldn't use that term, but that's a concept I gleaned. Like construction. There needs, to be, there needs to be appropriate differentiation in terms of categories and sectors um, and circumstances uh, in order to make prescripts. And historically, Sean, I would disagree that in the past we've had a flexible thing. Um, National Treasury have not wanted it to be flexible. They've wanted to have a one size fits all. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the fact that they that we've been able to work around that has been a positive thing. Yeah. Uh, but going forward, they are saying you can't use any method that they don't allow you to use. Secondly, you can't use a method without going through the prescribed procedure. And thirdly, you've got to link it to the other parts of the PPP, like the committee system, et cetera. And that's where I don't know that they've got the appropriate debt yeah. or okay. Okay. to promote the procurement of complexity and innovation. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, thanks, Ron. Thank you. I, I'd like to throw this open to those who are online. We've got a good number of people here. Has anyone um, done any two-stage bidding as per these descriptions in the PFMA and MFMA? And how's it gone? Share with us your, your um, experiences in, in doing this. Um, so we've got a good number of people from local government, from... Um, uh, hey, Tandi. Morning, Sean. Morning, Good morning. Um, it was many, many, many years ago um, in the municipality, as it did indicate that it's about your performance specifications for buying electric meters. So what happened was that um, we, we issued a request for proposals, and then we were looking for electric meter solution. And then what then happened was there was a criteria that was developed whereby the bidders will come and still provide the documentation and also provide a do a presentation. And then from there, the decision will then be taken in terms of which ones we are coming close to what the municipality needed. And then from there, those ones would be the ones that would be invited for pricing. So what then happened was that after the presentations, then the specifications were altered because remember it's a, right, it's, a right, it's a request right. for proposal. Right, so right. we went to say we want prepaid meters. And then some companies came with some fancy things about having a SIM card whereby there'll be also some communication, like things that we never really thought of, mm, you know. Mm, but mm. what we also observed was a lot of them had a good ICT support whereby whatever that is ICT related that we would need, they would probably be able to. To, to provide it. So, so after the presentation, we then had to go back and then develop specification in line with what has been presented. I think we had like six or seven companies, mm. but we left with four, you know, we left with four. And then in this four, they were really innovative. And then we developed something that could more or less fit to what they were presenting. And then we invited them for pricing. They submitted their pricing. I remember one of them even came with this idea of a revenue um, part of, a revenue collecting agent, whereby they'll also assist us with collecting, selling electricity to 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 the to the to the community. But that one we were like, no, we don't want anyone touching our revenue. We will we'll leave that one out. And then after that, uh, we invited, we went back and then we did the spec, invited them like the normal RFQ, uh, but we opened it I think for fourteen days still like a tender, and then we evaluated, adjudicated, and then we awarded. So yeah, thanks. Well done, well done, Tony. And and just generally, I mean, how did you find it? Um, uh, did it did it work well? It sounded like it did. Um, can you appreciate the, the the that it's not always possible to put down the technical specifications up front, and hence we need this two stage process. It it did work well. It's just that what I've observed with our bid specification committee members is the fear. Mm -hmm. that comes with with that mm -hmm. it's something that because it's different people are not really mm -hmm. comfortable with yeah. with 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 putting it down there to say we can't do this i remember one thing though that was a gap that i picked up at the contract implementation stage was that 
there were also nice fancy things that were promised, which were never delivered and never monitored. You know, so that's one thing that I picked up was there were things that really we got attracted to, but come contract implementation. And another thing that I've realized soon is that it becomes difficult to monitor a contract that you're not really competent on whatever it is that you are requiring, you know. So I can manage a contract for a supply chain consultant because I'm a supply chain person myself. But if I'm a supply chain person, you want me to manage an engineering contract, there will be certain gaps. So what I've picked up was gaps started popping up at contract implementation stage because we actually never thought of, do we have the capacity to now monitor this kind of contract? So, yeah. Good, good. And how did you find the engagement with the bidders? What was the actual engagement with the bidders? You know, discussions and... Uh, you said presentations, I guess there were presentations and there were discussions in the presentations. Of course, I mean, started yeah. with your compulsory briefing session and then at the, at, the, at the presentation, it was quite interesting in the form of, you know, you move from being a presentation to more of a conversation because now, I mean, people started, like I said, yeah. they came up with fancy, fancy, crazy things that we never thought existed, you know? And then, and then it was more like, tell us more. What is this? Yes, we, we, we had a structure of the presentation. We highlighted what we wanted them to provide. But the key word was the following, but not limited to, you know. But mm -hmm. these are the basics mm -hmm. that you were looking mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. but you are allowed to give us anything. And we're not going to dictate for you on how to go about it. But again, Sean, even on the presentation, I mean, we realized that we thought it was a revenue tender, but it kind of like took an ICT mm, identity yes. mm, of sort, mm, you know? Mm. And now we realize they're like, okay, fortunately enough, the, the head of ICT was a new standing member of the education committee. Mm. It's, but like I said, that when now the presentations start coming through, then we realize that it's not just revenue. It's revenue, it's ICT, is, and that's where then even the contract monitoring becomes tricky to say that, is the ICT people a better position to monitor this contract or is the revenue people? So so it, it was quite an experience. I, I do think if AG or Italy, there could have been findings, but I prayed hard that there wouldn't be any, you know. So yeah, it was something new and yeah, one of those things that you're not so, so confident about at the end. <laughs> so, so so do you think it was the praying that... that um... Um, I, I in, think sure there weren't findings or was it um... I think it was the praying more than anything else <laughs> because really it became tricky when we start getting yeah. into it because like I'm saying that you realize when you are into it that I don't know this thing yeah yeah like, like what's going yeah. on we could have yeah. evaluated this in an unfair way we could have picked up things that we don't need yeah. uh, you know we don't yeah. know yeah. and in the yeah. end we ended up getting the first basic thing was a a, a prepaid electricity, I mean, let, electric meter, prepaid electricity meter that has certain functionalities, those basics we got. But any other additional things which we based our evaluation on, chances are maybe we didn't even get, mm. you know. So, so yeah, it was um, a one time thing, I've never done it before. Uh, Ron, if you don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Jacobus to come in. Uh, Jacobus raised his hand. Hi, Jacobus. Okay, go ahead, Ron. You might have a question for, for Tandi. Um, Sean, uh, bear with me. I've, for some reason, I'm focused on the governance. Um, and because of the whole innovation bent and complexity, um, it got me thinking. Um, the process before specification is requirements. Uh, it's market research. It's doing a reality check. The specifications uh, writing um, is really just to enact what is the outcome of the requirements process. And it suggests in my mind, I haven't seen it anywhere else in the world, so maybe this is original, an original thought, and as with most of my original thoughts, it's probably ludicrous, but um, but let me share it for what it's worth, is I suspect that when you're doing, um, uh, uh, when you are in the circumstances that you've so well documented, that the, the requirements phase, if I can call it that, and requirements to me 
includes, so we need another term, includes market research um, in terms of market capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that phase maybe should be separated from the actual specification. And the constituents of both of those phases, there will be overlap. Um, but, but what I'm suggesting is that there's maybe a, a requirements and market research committee, which then leads to um, documenting and coming up with, um, with uh, that. And that role might also include the, the particular type of specification and the particular type of method. Once that's determined, it can then be handed over to the specifications committee, which has hopefully a, a professionalized approach to writing and putting it on paper the actual requirements. As I say, it's probably the world's worst idea, but I'm just showing important work. Thanks, Sean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good job. Um, Jacobus, Mobusella, you raised your hand. Love, love you to, to contribute if you're able to. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question of, of Tandi. If anyone else has, has got any suggestion, any um, examples to share, please, please do. Um, Tandi, do you think that on reflection, the process was longer or shorter as a result of the approach that you took? I, I think for me, uh, Sean, the end justifies the means. Yeah. You know, we, we, we could have gone your normal 90 day uh, tender procurement process. And I like to keep uh, referring to performance specifications. It's something that we don't even discuss at the specification level. Sometimes you yeah, find that yeah. at evaluation, you find people have priced in a different way. You don't yeah. know how to compare apples with apples and all of yeah, that. Yeah. So I think I think for me, it's not even about worrying about how long it takes. It's about what is it that we're gonna get out of out of this. Mm -hmm. And if on average that's how long it takes, then you know, um, it well the first stage took a normal ninety day period because, like I said. Once we started, then we realized that we actually are not so sure about understanding mm -hmm. how this whole thing works, mm -hmm. you know. And then by the time we went to the second stage, we had to clean up a lot because bidders in their presentation, they brought a lot of information that we were not aware of. I mean, some of them, there's even some regulatory bodies that govern certain things. There's some certifications that needs to be there. Now we had to go back. And I think Ron, when he talks about market research, I think that's one thing that I think lacked in our in our space, we just relied on the user department saying, this is what I want, and off we went. But if we did a market research started, we'd be in a better position to also advise the user department in terms of how to put that together this thing. So when we were done with that, by the time we went for the second time, maybe it became longer because we started to not start it correctly. Had we started it correctly with the normal process as Ron had outlined, it would probably would have worked out even shorter, noting what mm, is it that mm, we wanted to get out of it. Mm. But it was quite an interesting experience for me. You know, it was quite an yeah, because yeah. you go to a space where like there's this kind of what do they call it? Unconscious incompetence. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know yes, yes, <laughs> until yes. you get there. You know, so it was it was quite interesting because now you are head of supply chain. We expected to provide all answers for everything, but you kind of like what what is this? I don't understand what's going on. So yeah. And, and I ask you this because, Tandi, I mean, as, as you, you're a supply chain professional in public procurement, I mean, one of the things that we often are guilty of is the user comes to us and says, this is what we're looking for. And we say, this is not detailed enough. Go, go away. Do more market research. Get out there. You know, let's, run, let's do an RFI. And so we kind of drag out this process to try and come up with this technical specification, which we, we say, okay, this is this going to give you what you want. And we may not be there, and it takes quite a while to go through all of that market research and to, to put that together. And then we go out, and then, then we have difficulties in the briefing session where questions are raised, and why have you got this like this? And then we have to do updates there, and then it becomes difficult when we, we're busy trying to um, evaluate and compare apples with apples. and. And um, you know, so overall, we try and make this a one-stage process, but it takes longer. Whereas if we just say, hey, let's agree two-stage, might actually be quicker and more effective. 
I think for us, we realized when we were there that we don't know for this. Mm, we, we do yeah, not know. Yeah. We were not, no, we were not yet mature, at that stage. Mature, mature, mature. Yeah, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. We're not matured to, yeah. to do that. But yeah. hey, you throw yourself in the deep end, you come up with lessons from that. So yeah. Good one. Thanks, Sandy. Fuck farewell. That's um if there's if there's nothing more, um then let's uh, let's call it a day. Uh if you if you found some value in the discussion, um you know, please please let me know if you think that we should continue this discussion on methods. Happy to do that. I do have a gap next week, and we can certainly talk about another method next week if there's interest. Um there's, uh, it might be interesting to to maybe explore a little bit the performance-based specification or outcome-based specification and what those are and how those are different. I uh, saw so a very interesting article late last week that functional specifications, not the functional as in uh, preference kind of regulations 2011, 2017, but functional regulations are far quicker to put together than, um, than a technical specification. So... Um, yeah, um, let us know if, you, if you're keen on some things like this so that we continue this methods discussion. I think it was Tandy that suggested that we do get into it. Happy to do that. Ron, you've got, so, uh, you've yes, got the closing I, comment. I, well, Sean, uh, I, I had, a, I had a, a, a contribution, but if you want me to close as well, I'm happy to do so. Please so, contribute, yeah. My, so my contribution is really... You know, do we want to go with the method next week with the gap? Yes. Uh, and it begs the question, which method? And uh, we keep using negotiation, including here. Mm. It would be nice to start teasing that out just to start the journey on the negotiation method. And Sean, if I'm to make a closing comment, um, thank you for an excellent contribution. And I know you won't mind if I use this platform to advertise um, the fact that uh, you are planning to publish a book. Yes, we lost Ron there. I don't know if it's my side or real wing ding. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ron. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. So um, all, all of this is very useful and this, uh, I think we'll go into a book. So thank you, Ron. Um, Ingrid, Henry, just saying yeah. thank you very much, Sean, um, and congratulations on an imminent book. We all look forward to that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you, everybody. I'll pick, we'll, up, offline. I'll pick up offline. Thank, thanks, Henry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks uh, Sean. We'll, we'll, try, we'll try and get this. Hello, Lorraine. Nice to see you. Thank you, Martin, for coming in. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Martin, Monday, one day we must uh, talk a little bit more about... Um, the public procurement, uh, in fact, you don't call it a public procurement act, it's a procurement act in the UK. Yeah. And just how that's going and, um, you know, just some lessons and experiences that I think um, would be useful to understand here. So, um, yeah. Well, as I say, I think probably the lessons would go both ways. Yes. I think there are still stuff we could learn from uh, your experiences, however, however painful some of those experiences have been so far, but Either which way, thanks, Martin. Talk and yeah, let's let's catch off a uh, uh, catch catch up offline from this in the future. Good one. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tandy. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Advocate and Saluba. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>